The first subject that we have to cover is about salt replacement and the most important question is how fast and how much. Rapid correction of sodium can be instituted in the presence of severe neurologic complications such as seizures. We can usually abort the seizures by increasing the serum sodium by 3 to 7 millimoles per litre. In acute hyponatremia, such as a hyponatremia that is of less than 48 hour duration, rapid correction can be well tolerated and should actually be undertaken. In chronic hyponatremia, which has been present for more than 48 hours or of an unknown duration, the suggested therapeutic goal in the first 24 hours is to increase the sodium by less than 8 millimoles per litre. This is a very important target which we should try not to exceed. The targets of sodium correction is very conservative for the fear of osmotic demyelination syndrome. The symptoms such as dysarthria, dysphagia, seizures and even a locked-in syndrome is only re irreversible or at best partially reversible. The clinical manifestations of osmotic demyelination might take up to two to six days to develop after an overly rapid correction. How much sodium should we give in order to stick within the safety limits of sodium correction? Conventionally, this is calculated using total body water multiplied by the sodium deficit. We will then select the concentration of the solution that we require, such as normal saline at 154 mEq per litre or 3% sodium chloride at 514 mEq per litre. And this is infused over 24 hours. The problem with the conventional calculation is that it assumes the patient to be something like a fish tank. It is a non-dynamic model and does not take into account the changes in volume status with the infusion. Biological systems do not behave like a fish tank, which is a simple and single compartment. There are various determinants of the plasma sodium concentration acting in different compartments. Looking at the extracellular compartment, the main osmolite is sodium, while the main osmolite in the intracellular fluid is potassium. Sodium and potassium do not cross the cell membrane freely, as opposed to water, and they are therefore effective osmolites. This determines the distribution of water across the membranes, and therefore eventually plasma sodium concentration. These are also termed as exchangeable sodium and exchangeable potassium. Exchangeable in the sense that they can be exchanged by the sodium-potassium exchanger based on the various physiologic conditions. And these are the electrolytes that determine the distribution of water. This is one of the seminal paper in Sodium and Water Balance, published in 1958 by Edelman et al. It correlates the exchangeable sodium with exchangeable potassium and total body water. Many years later, Adruguer Madiast used conventional formulas which we use for managing dysnatremias, for example, sodium requirements is equal to total body water times desired sodium minus current sodium. They derived the equation and worked out the impact of infusing one liter of infusate. So the change in sodium concentration after giving one liter of the infusate is equals to the infusate sodium concentration minus the current serum sodium concentration divided by total body water plus one. It turns out that this formula is rather similar to the Edelman formula and therefore also takes into account the dynamic nature of the biologic model in correcting dysnatremias. Although the Adrugue Madias formula 
is calculated based on a mathematical model, the formula itself has been clinically validated in a few studies, and it predicted with relative accuracy the changes in serum sodium in most of the patients with some caveats of possible overcorrection in some subsets of uh, patients. In two clinical scenarios, volume depletion and primary polydipsia, none of the known formulas will be able to accurately calculate the change in the serum sodium. This may actually result in overcorrection in a large majority of cases if we are not careful and if we are too dependent on the formula. In these clinical scenarios, we should focus on correcting the underlying causes of volume depletion and preventing further intake of free water in the patients. The next thing we will cover is the management of SIADH. What are the treatment options in a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone? First and foremost, we have to restrict further free water intake by the patient. In severe hyponatremia, we have to administer salt, usually in the form of 3% sodium chloride. We must increase the, the solute intake of the patient, as we know that the maximum amount of urine and free water excretion in the urine is dependent upon the urine osmolites. Some old studies have advocated giving salt administration together with loop diuretics. However, the results may be very erratic as the proportion of salt to water loss varies across different patients. The meclocycline can be used. This induces a state of a nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Lithium also causes the kidneys to become ADH unresponsive. And finally, we have the Veptans. The Veptan is a V2 receptor antagonist, and it has been demonstrated to stimulate free water excretion with little or no sodium loss. The earliest studies showing the effectiveness of Veptans are the SALT studies, SALT-1 is carried out in the United States, while a similarly organized SALT-2 study is carried out in Europe. In patients with chronic heart failure, cirrhosis and SIADH, serum sodium increases significantly with tolveptin. The side effects, common side effects include thirst, a dry mouth, and of course increased urination. Serious events include hypotension, dizziness, and syncope. However, given the potential for side effects of the veptans, including serious liver dysfunction, veptans are usually limited to moderate cases of chronic hyponatremia, especially in patients with altered mentation. Fluid restriction is usually adequate in mild hyponatremia and in patients who are asymptomatic.